All right, good afternoon. I'm Steve Kelly. I'm the CEO of Ellenville Regional Hospital in uh, Ellenville, which is in Ulster County, New York. Um, before I jump into our remarks, I would like to thank the presenters that are presenting with us, Pam and Meg, for such a nice uh, presentation. When you think about it, their description of rural America is pretty universal. Anyone in this room who has a connection to rural America probably could see their own their own uh, community. So uh, let me just keep moving here. It, it's housekeeping. We're supposed to um, talk about our successes and so forth, which we're going to do. Um, I'm going the wrong way. Let's go backwards. Let's go backwards. So we have our objectives. Um, I'm not going to read those. Uh, so basically, we came into uh, into this space in 2015, and it was a little bit before the opioid epidemic was really known. In Ulster County, in 2014, year before, I think there was about 15 deaths in a county of 200,000, and. Um, you know, while that made a difference, it really wasn't seen as the problem that it was going to turn into. And New York State in 2015 got a $7 billion opioid waiver. Let me give you a little bit of, um, a little bit, they, they got a $7 billion waiver and they wanted to redesign the Medicaid system. And so it had nothing to do with opioids. And they came in, and they came to us and they wanted us to participate in this program to reduce unnecessary ER visits by 25%, which meant really all of the ER visits, not just the ones that they thought might be unnecessary, because I asked them that. They said, no, we want you to reduce all of them by 25%. So um, we started looking at our data these are the fatalities over the last several years. And you can see that they went up 15 in 2014. And the year we started in this, it was 30, it doubled. Suddenly we started noticing, and then it was 45, 42, 56. It was really uh, going up. But back in 2015, we were looking at this, and we discovered that there was a very large population chronic pain patients that would come into our emergency department. They would let us radiate them, draw gallons of blood from them. That's a bit of an exaggeration, actually. Um, and they would let us do anything because really what they wanted was the water. I need the water. And push it quick because that's how it works best. And it's a fine line, really, between treating pain and enabling addiction. And we realized that we were part of the problem. One of the things that, that was terrible to me as someone who had encouraged our ER physicians, listen, you know, patient satisfaction is kind of important. Who are you to necessarily argue with how someone feels pain? We should be generous and give them, give them relief which is exactly the wrong thing to do. And I went to the medical staff and I asked them to rethink what we were doing and to ignore everything that I had told them before. I said, we have to pivot. This is a time for us to develop new protocols where we stop giving the juice to people. That doesn't, it wasn't that easy. We had to get that through the full medical staff. And um, at first, there was a little bit of resistance. Somebody jumped up and said, We don't want that guy with the tie telling us how to practice medicine. Many of you probably have heard that kind of thing. But then somebody kind of tugged on his arm and said, Sit down. Finally, somebody's listening to us. We've been complaining about his uh, prodding us in this direction. So we developed these new. Uh, protocols, and we had some remarkable results. Our, our medical staff are fantastic. We reduced uh, the high utilizer population 77%. 
We reduced opioid administration in the emergency department 92 percent. 92 percent. Think of the alternative, you know, say only 8 percent. Less than 2 percent of our patients left with an opiate prescription. And at that time it was about 8.1 percent on a national level. So as we got into it, we discovered that one of the big complaints was that there was no access for people to get into treatment. So we pivoted. And when we pivoted, we started a project called Project Rescue. And Project Rescue was all about having Suboxone available in our emergency department. We had all of our emergency providers waivered so they could prescribe it. We worked with Catholic Charities and other partners, the Institute for Family Health, Step One, and others who, who were willing to take the patients from, on a longitudinal basis. So we would prescribe Suboxone in the ER when we found, found someone who had overdosed and was brought in. And some of those folks were being brought in by the local sheriff's department. And the sheriff and my partner here, our partner, we were partners and Gates together intertwined, was bringing patients in and we were getting them into, we were trying to attempt to get them into treatment. Um, you know, we we're trying to reduce morbidity, mortality. We had medication available 24 hours a day, which is something that's unusual. We had this transition so we could get them right into treatment. And it was, it was disappointing to, to us because um, while well, we revived a lot of people and we brought in peers and we had really interesting ways of trying to convince them that now is the time. We thought there was a teaching moment that after you just narrowly, narrowly escaped death, now is the time to make the change and come into treatment. Well, what happened was about only 25% of the people took that option, which meant I felt we had a failure, though I'm told by many that that was a really good performance. But um, it, uh, it was disturbing to me that 75%, the vast majority, didn't want treatment. And so we realized that we didn't really know as much as we thought we knew about, about substance abuse and addiction. And so we had to yet again. We're getting pretty good at this point. So what we did next is we went to a prevention agenda, very much like what was described by the our last group from Connecticut. You know, there's an imaginary line that separates New York and Connecticut. You can't see it when you drive over it. We're really kind of the same people. So I'd like to point that out. They have the same problems that, are, that we have on our side of the line. Um, so we went into a prevention mode and we really did a lot of Narcan training. We did a lot of Narcan training. We trained thousands of people, families, we reached out. We had Narcan uh, kits that we gave to people. We had um, uh, these bags that we had so that people could so that people could destroy their <coughs> medications that they didn't need anymore. We had uh, a repository for and encouraged the community to bring in their leftover medications. We got hundreds and hundreds of pounds of, of medications. It's amazing how much medications people have in their, in their medicine cabinets. I suppose now they've been mostly picked over because that's how a lot of it gets out into the, the population. So let me see, I have a slide on that, the harm reduction bags, fentanyl strips, safer use kits. We did all those, we did all the training. We did an awful lot. But yet, it really still wasn't enough. And so now I'm gonna introduce where the sheriff steps in, steps in. Please welcome one bigger rope, Sheriff of Washington. Thank you, Susan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Juan Figueroa, I'm the sheriff of Ulster County. Um, one thing that the narrator can say is I did 25 years in the state police, and 19 of those 25 years were dedicated 
to narcotics investigations. If you go to my office, I have huge breasts, 93 kilos, $10 million worth of heroin. So many different uh, money seizures that occurred. But I also knew then, like I knew when I took office, that we were only just scratching the surface on this problem. I remember the crack epidemic. I remember what happened to folks that looked like me. What happened to poor folks. And now nobody cared. And no one did anything. I, re I was hearing the same stories from the 1980s over this epidemic. And I, I had an opportunity to change that and to look at it in a different way. Some would say, why law enforcement? With all the harm that we have done to certain peoples in certain communities, and I get it. Why? Because we're the first ones there. And we had to change the way we deal with this situation. We had to change our behavior on how we dealt with this epidemic. And that's exactly why I intended to do and did. And this started in 2019. I'm going to talk about Elmwood Hospital for a second, though, because, um, you know, hospital shopping at the ER, we all saw back when this epidemic was in the middle of the beginning. It was absolutely horrible what was going on. We were able to take some of his folks right to rehab because he couldn't find a ride to get them there. And in turn, I had an opportunity and the members of my office to take folks to his hospital in the middle of the night when something happened. It was a partnership that had to occur. So I got elected in 2019, and in that summer I developed the opioid responses county law enforcement. And the first thing I did, even though we put in for a grant and didn't get it, the COSAC grant, we did get what we did wrong from the EJA, but I started the program anyway with the minimal funds that we all in the rural communities run into. We don't have the money to deal with this problem. And so I started by asking for donations from people who lost loved ones. And we were able to get this camper um, that looked like somebody's home and what to look for because we enabled folks ourselves and not even knowing about it. We didn't know our loved ones were addicted to opioids until they switched over to heroin and it got worse or fentanyl. So it was about awareness, it was about uh, educating folks about the issues that they have in their own home. But we did get that grant in 2020, uh, and it was all about collaboration with our partners. It wasn't an issue strictly by law enforcement, but it was about a, a collaboration with all the folks in our community. You guys heard of Woodstock, right? That's my county. And uh, <laughs> Holston County is a unique place, I'll say that. <laughs> but one thing we know how to do is pull together when there's a crisis. We were number two in the state of New York on overdoses and fatalities for, for 100,000 per capita. And we had to change that. In 2021, we received an innovative uh, program award from the Rural Justice Collaborative and the National Center for State Courts. I'm going to tell you how, why that's important. Other rural communities have the same issues that we do. Why we invent the wheel? Let's talk to each other and come up with better solutions, and that's exactly what I took advantage of. In 2022, uh, the Department of Health got another a grant and added a peer. When we got the grant, I was able to get social worker and peer advocates to go out and a high risk mitigation team after we got referrals to get people into rehab and more importantly, help us stop the victims that are the family members who are afraid about their loved one having, you know, uh, this this affliction. How many times have you heard a 25 year old that passed away with a heart attack? We don't know what happened there. So we had to change behavior, not only with law enforcement, but the loved ones that were associated with these addictions. I'm not going to talk too much about the MAP program, the medical assisted treatment program that I started in the jail in 2019, but I will say that it's now the law in New York, and we were ahead of that. And that's the, uh, the trailer that I was talking about, the camera. And this has to be a phased in approach because in law enforcement, we have a hard time changing. 
We just do. And so uh, we phase this in, and phase two is that high risk mitigation team I was telling you about, and I'll explain that to you. So we got a grant for $900,000 COSAC PJA grant. Uh, in 2009, we had an enhancement grant in just this past year in October for $1.3 million. This is how it works. We get referrals from law enforcement. We get referrals from uh, loved ones. We get referrals from other uh, folks, which I'll talk about at the next slide. And we go out with our, our team, our high-risk mitigation team, and those are our partners in the right there, our community team partners. We get them into treatment. Uh, we talk about harm reduction, reduction and the linkage to get them there. We refer them to our peers. We have weekly management meetings, and then we, we have ongoing uh, care management for these folks. We follow them through and don't let them fall through the cracks. Each one of us in our rural counties have these partners. You have to go out and seek them. That's what we do. These are the stats from last year. And I want to talk about the 52% and the 48% referrals that we got from the criminal justice side. It took me quite a long time to get all the chiefs to get on board to give us the information that we needed to send the high risk mitigation team out to get these folks the help that they need. But we were able to accomplish that. I have a shutters app. So anyone can refer using it anonymously. The sheriff's app. We also, uh, emergency management, which is a great partner, also has an app called I, I Am Responding. So my team, every time that there's an overdose, uh, they get advised right away and they send the team out. Initially, I said, we'll, we'll go out to an overdose within 24 hours. Our team's able to go to these overdoses sometimes in my time, right when they, after they occur, after 911 gets called. So 98% of those numbers consented to peer services, and 42% of them were referred and entered rehab and or detox. Remember, not every program uh, is for everyone, so you have to tailor it to those individuals. We also gave them public housing and employment services. And then we also, 30% of them started them on, we started them on Medicaid, Medicaid uh, uh, opioid use disorder, or MAP. The biggest number that you see on this screen, though, is that 43% we have retained in our program beyond the 30 days. That's big. And that's about building a trust with folks that even though they commit these small crimes and end up uh, in the county jail, they're not true criminals. They're not. They're doing it to support their habits. And it's a disease. Let's talk about the future for a second. This framework that I talked about, this high-risk mitigation team, this is the future of law enforcement. If you have a, like we all have, all these issues with mental health, uh, we're gonna assemble a team that's gonna go out and do similar to what our Oracle team is doing, to go out the mental health calls. And I go to what we've all heard before, when you call 911 and uh, you, you ask for help from law enforcement, when they get there, somebody ends up being dead. It's got to stop. And it stops by putting a team together and bringing civilians in and vetting them with law enforcement to go out and get these people the help that they need and not causing their death, which is just unbelievable for me in today's world of law enforcement. What's next? I'm going to bring up Steve Kelly to explain that. I also want to thank you all for having me here today. Thank you. So when we talk about results, the last slide that I started with was 2018. We were able to drive down deaths 41% in 2019. We were thinking that you know we're making a lot of progress. And then COVID hit, and look what happened. And look at that 2023. Uh, that was through February. We had only 13 deaths, and we were thinking we're making a difference again. And then we had 11 deaths in March, or 24 in the first quarter, 11 in one month. If that continues, 
we're going to need a lot bigger page to be able to fit over a hundred deaths in. So we're, we are motivated. The, the challenge is just getting worse. So what we were thinking about, Next, sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. That's probably me. I'm technically incompetent. Sorry. Anyway, um, so what we're looking at now is we're looking at integrating a number of different data streams, and our goal is to be able to develop a risk profile with lots of different indicators that are coming from these different data streams. And some of those data streams include medical, so those are like all of the hospital visits if someone ends up in an ER, really anywhere in New York because we have a statewide repository. Mental health cases, many of the providers are now getting the kind of electronic health records that in, in uh, medical health we've had for a long time. And we're getting uh, the sheriff's information on all the calls that they have, that information is being integrated in. We also are working to get the medical examiner's information, so that has a complete toxicology and the real cause of death. We think that there, and they also have information that is found in the scene, that's often uh, collected by law enforcement, but it may be in different ways aggregated within the medical examiner's view of the case. And we're looking at the social determinants of healthcare, which are being collected now in hospitals in New York. That's a new program. When you add all of those together, we have an enormous and interesting data set that would be different than what's been done before. And our goal is to work with the Health Information Exchange of New York Hickstein who has a great deal of statisticians and they'll be using us for kind of our on the ground knowledge. And they will be analyzing that data to build a predictive model that will be able to be used by all of the different partners who are following individual patients. So that if a patient shows up in an emergency department or is being discharged from the jail, or has some other major crisis in their life that shows up in maybe their therapist's office, we'll be able to determine that they're at a higher risk. And in, in that way, as we deploy our resources, what better way to, re, to deploy resources than to deploy it to the persons that need it the most? And so if we get invited back next year, we'll give you an update. Thank you very much.